All right, everybody, we are going to turn our attention here to surgical disorders that involve the colon. So this is a very, very common um, organ to come up on surgical questions on the USMLE. And pretty much everything we're going to talk about is pretty high yield, maybe m medium yield, but most of it's pretty high yield for your exam. So you're going to want to really, really pay attention here and possibly even watch this lecture twice. And so I'm going to try to keep it concise, uh, but I don't want to gloss over this stuff because it is absolutely essential knowledge for your exam. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get updates and notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, so we're going to look over colonic neoplasia. Um, we're going to talk about the col uh, colon polyps. Um, these, unlike the other polyps that we've talked about, like uh, stomach polyps and small intestine polyps, these come up. These come up fairly frequently because we diagnose them or we see them when we do a colonoscopy. And we do colonoscopies all the time uh, for, for screening, even on healthy people. We'll talk about colorectal cancer. We'll talk about diverticulitis. And then we'll talk about sigmoid valvulus and toxic megacolon. These are roughly going in order of high yield to, I'm not going to say low yield, less high yield. Okay, these are all high yield. All right, so colon polyps, they tend to occur in older people. It takes about 10 years for a premalignant polyp to go to a carcinoma. They call that the adenoma carcinoma sequence. All cancers begin as an adenoma. So the idea here is that we do colonoscopies every 10 years on anybody. Sometimes we do it more frequently, but we do colonoscopies every 10 years on anybody and um, if we find a polyp, then we know that um, we should remove that. And if we remove all the polyps, then we can be fairly confident that the patient is not going to develop colon cancer before their next uh, screening colonoscopy. So routine surveillance is recommended for all patients at average risk starting at age 45. That is actually new. Um, and so... Um, it used to be 50, but now it's 45, but we still remain every 10 years after that. There are conflicting recommendations, but this is from the USPSTF, which is a, a fairly reliable source for your exam. Um, so a lot can be predicted about a polyp based on its appearance and characteristics, and that's going to be important that you know uh, based on the description of the polyp. Now, you're not going to be expected to look at a, a slide, but know based on the description of the polyp uh, what the likelihood of that polyp is of turning into cancer. And so here I put a uh, just the different types of polyps that you can run into. I want to turn your attention here to tubular, tubulo villus, and villus. This gets asked a lot. Tubular is very unlikely to ever become cancer, whereas villus and tubulo villus, they are much more likely to become cancer. And then also uh, polyps that are serrated are more likely to become cancer. So here are uh, some... Uh, suppositions that you can make of a polyp based on different characteristics. So obviously, bigger polyps are more likely to become malignant. Sessile polyps are more likely to become malignant versus if they're pedunculated, um, which would mean that they, I'm sorry, my pen is disappearing on me. Uh, but basically, if they are, if they have a stalk, they're more likely to be benign and stay benign. All right, so there are a few different familial disorders that raise your risk of colon polyps. I'm not going to go into all of these in great detail, uh, but again, I put them in order here of what's most likely to come up. Familial adenomatous polyposis, these patients always go on to develop colon cancer, and so once we diagnose this, uh, we remove the colon. Juvenile polyposis is not called that because it happens in children. It does happen in children, but it can be diagnosed in adults. It's called juvenile polyposis because the polyps are called juvenile polyps. And then Putz-Jäger syndrome, uh, this is hamartomas and hyperpigmentation, and so naturally these are going to be hamartomas in the colon. 
All right, so moving on to colorectal cancer, this is the third most common cancer in the developed world and becoming uh, more uh, common um, as we uh, are, are finding more, um, but that's been abated a little bit by detecting and removing potentially cancerous polyps or pre-malignant polyps. Uh, but one of the problems is that a big risk factor for colon cancer is a low fiber diet and a, a diet that's high in processed meats. And that's obviously a problem of the developed world. Uh, these can occur throughout the colon. The most common location is the proximal colon, but it can really happen just about anywhere. Uh, Histologically, almost all colorectal cancers are adenocarcinomas. The symptoms are going to depend on what side the tumor is on. Just use your common sense, right? So if it's on the right side, you're probably not going to see a whole lot. You might have some cramping, colicky abdominal pain due to obstructive symptoms, uh, obstructive process. Uh, you may see melena or maroon stools. Very, very important. Anytime a patient comes in with GI complaints that you're always getting a stool GUAC test, on CCS, that will be part of your rectal physical exam. So you don't need to put in an additional order for that. On the left side, because the bleeding is closer to the anus, uh, you may may see more dramatic appearing red coated stools. You can get a change in stool caliber because it's obstructing um, the stool as it passes down, usually semi-solid or even solid stool. This will be particularly the case if it's occurring in the rectum or the sigmoid. And then with any of these, you can get changes in bowel habits. So they may be constipated and then they may go through a period where they're having increased um, frequency. And in any of these, you can have your typical cancer symptoms like fatigue, weight loss, nausea, and vomiting. Best initial and most accurate diagnostic test is a colonoscopy with biopsy. Uh, send that off to pathology. If they're diagnosed with colon cancer, you need to get a chest x-ray, a CT abdomen looking for METs, and get a carcinoembryonic antigen titer, CEA titer. The treatment for colon cancer is segmental resection of the bowel along with nodes and mesentery that will help you stage. And the further treatment, whether or not we do chemotherapy, is based on the stage. It is very, very important that you know if you find a colon cancer in the sigmoid or in the descending colon, you need to do a, an entire colonoscopy anyway um, to look for other potential foci of cancer. Lynch syndrome raises your risk for colon cancer. It does not actually cause polyps. Um, that's why they call it hereditary. You inherit it. Uh, Non-polyposis colorectal cancer. And you can look at this more if you want, but this is another one of those conditions in which we begin colonoscopies early and we test them uh, much more frequently. Diverticular diseases, you should be familiar with diverticulosis, typically a consequence, again, of a low-fiber diet. Um, so diverticulosis itself is not so much of a problem. The problem is when one of those diverticulum become infected. Um, that causes diverticulitis. The part of the colon most susceptible to diverticuli is the sigmoid, and the rectum tends to be spared. The main complications of diverticulosis is diverticular bleeding, which can be really significant. So you keep that on your differential for bright red blood per rectum or melan or sorry, or uh, hematochesia, and then diverticulitis, which we're going to talk about here. So diverticulitis is an infection of the diverticulum occurring in patients with pre-existing diverticulosis. However, some patients who have diverticulitis do not have a pre-existing diagnosis, even though they most certainly do have diverticulosis. It just hasn't been caught yet. Uh, the symptoms here, left lower quadrant pain. There's not a lot of things that cause left lower quadrant pain. All right, we think of right lower quadrant, appendicitis, right upper quadrant, gallbladder, you know, so this left lower quadrant pain is there aren't many things that cause it. Um, if the, because this is an infection, you can get fever and chills. Uh, you may be able to appreciate an abdominal mass, but I wouldn't rely on that. And then if there is a rupture, uh, perforation, you can get generalized peritonitis. You should get labs here. Beta HCG, you may or may not get. 
Um, most of these patients are quite older. Uh, we're talking 50s, 60s, 70s, so we're not really thinking about pregnant patients here. Um, the diagnosis, if they have pre-existing diverticulosis, you can diagnose this clinically, but on the exam, I would err on the side of getting imaging. The best diagnostic test is a CT abdomen with contrast. Do not ever do a colonoscopy on a suspected diverticulitis patient because you will uh, possibly perforate them and then you've got all sorts of problems on hand that you wouldn't otherwise have if you avoided the colonoscopy. So this is what you see in diverticulitis and oh, my pen is back, great. Uh, so uh, you can see these air-filled uh, holes along with um, uh, feces in the, uh, in the sigmoid. So the treatment, um, all patients, regardless of whether they have mild or severe symptoms, should be put on a low residue or clear liquid diet. Uh, if they have mild symptoms, i.e. they don't have signs of peritonitis, they don't have a fever, white count, and all that stuff, uh, you can just give them oral antibiotics, go with Augmentin, Amoxicillin, Clavulanate. If they have severe symptoms, so a high white count, a uh, high fever, certainly peritonitis. You're going to put them on uh, a broad spectrum antibiotic with good gram negative and, uh, and anaerobic coverage. So piperacillin tazobactam would be an example of that. Miropenem is also fine. Uh, and then these patients should be NPO. And of course, we're going to have to have them on IV fluids. Peritonitis, so rigidity, guarding, uh, rebound tenderness, um, those are, that's an indication for laparotomy. And that pretty much goes for anything. If you've got whatever and then you have an acute abdomen, you're going to need to do surgery. There are a number of complications. The big one is abscess. You'll do drainage with CT guidance, so that may come up. These patients will tend to not get better with, with antibiotics alone because abscesses, there's not good penetration for antibiotics there, and so you'll continue to have symptoms. After these patients recover, you'll want to do a colonoscopy to rule out an underlying malignancy. And then, of course, you could get asked this, especially on step three, what's the best way to prevent diverticulosis, and future bouts of diverticulitis, high fiber diet. All right, so sigmoid valvulus is uh, very, very important here. Um, so this is a torsion of the sigmoid colon uh, along the axis of its mesentery. Uh, this is particularly a disease of elderly and institutionalized patients. This is going, this is a large bowel obstruction, so you're going to have that colicky abdominal pain. Uh, the diagnosis here is simple. It's an abdominal x-ray. It's clear as day when you see it. Um, it's, it's one of the most obvious things on, on x-ray. My mom could diagnose this. Uh, barium contrast enema may be performed as long as they don't have any signs of peritonitis. You can also go the gastrographin uh, enema. That would be fine too, uh, water-soluble enema. The treatment is going to be, is, is actually fairly simple, provided that they don't have signs of peritonitis. What you'll do is endoscopic detorsion, and then you'll place a rectal tube um, on that. So um, that's, that's fairly simple. This is the coffee bean sign. Like I told you, very obvious here. So, um, I mean, you can't miss it. I don't need to explain this to you. This is a massively dilated sigmoid colon. Remember, the sigmoid colon kind of comes down like that. That's why they call it sigmoid. Okay, so you, you can't miss it. Oh, there's also the bird of prey sign, but not this bird of prey. This bird of prey. So if you were to do a, a contrast enema, what you would see here is this kind of bird of prey looking appearance. It looks just like it. Okay, so here is not too obvious, but you can see the little beak there. All right, toxic megacolon, our last topic here, is uh, a complication typically of ulcerative colitis, but it can be a complication of any inflammatory disorder, including dysentery. What you have here is a colonic dilatation, therefore megacolon, and these patients have a toxic appearance. Don't you love it when the, the uh, most important parts of the disease are part of the name? So toxic appearance, dilated colon, and my pen is gone again. So the big problem here is that it raises the risk of perforation. Uh, look for these patients to have acute abdominal pain, possibly peritonitis, and they're going to have toxic features. They may have low blood pressure, altered mental status, fever. These patients may even be in septic shock. The best initial diagnostic step, 
However, you need to make sure if they are toxic and they are septic that you're tending to that first. But once they're stable, the best diagnostic step is an abdominal x-ray. Now, there are criteria, uh, but the problem is you need to have this radiographic evidence. And so we need to get the abdominal x-ray first. And then, you know, these things are just really obvious. I mean, signs of inflammation and then signs of toxicity. Okay, I'm sorry, my pen has gone again. Um, so don't memorize this criteria. Just know what these patients look like. The treatment here, we tend to their ABCs first, so volume resuscitation. These patients need to be NPO, so we're giving them IV fluids. Of course, broad-spectrum antibiotics, but make sure you get blood cultures first. My pen's gone. So blood cultures first, then broad-spectrum antibiotics. Uh, monitor them for electrolyte derangements. These patients should be in the ICU. When do we do surgery? Well, naturally, we're going to do surgery if they uh, have signs of perforation, if they don't show any improvement within 72 hours of monitoring, um, or if there's any kind of sign of hemorrhage. Um, so what you're going to see here, fairly obviously, is this thumb printing sign, okay, in a dilated colon. Oh, my pen is back now. I don't know what's going on. So these little thumb prints are indicative of toxic megacolon. Okay, sometimes it can be a little bit harder to see, but here you go. I mean, I imagine on your exam they're going to be pretty obvious. Now, if you do have a, um, a perforation, and this goes for anything, you want to make sure you're looking up by the diaphragm, particularly in between the diaphragm and the upper margin of the liver, you will be able to see free air. And this is a, a sine qua non for, for uh, a, a, a rupture or a, a perforation of the bowel. Um, so... This is important that you know this because this would be an indication for surgery, pneumoperitoneum. So here it's even more obvious.